so Brexit is quote done. Um, and yet here we are, three weeks now into the year, um, and already two very big industries, the fishing and farming uh, industries in this country, are already starting to say, um, you promised us things would be better for us outside the EU. You said you would replace subsidies and give us some sort of dividend. That hasn't happened. Farmers are already increasingly angry at the UK government for not providing protections against cheap food being imported into this country, which would absolutely undermine British the British farming industry. Why? Because the Tories are currently being in are literally in thrall currently to the most hard right section of their party, the free market fundamentalists, who are obsessed with the idea that it's okay because the market will solve it. And hey, if there's cheap food coming into the market, well, all these farmers have to do is produce cheap food themselves, which means, yeah, we'll get rid of, you know, all these things protecting food safety and standards and animal welfare protection so that they too can just go crazy and produce cheap food. That's not what people want. That's not what people voted for. That's not what the farmers themselves want because then that then cuts them off from another bigger market, the European Union. And it's shocking when you realise that this is the current ideology that's running the Tory party. It's okay, the market will solve it. It, it really is wor worrying because that could be applied to so many things. We're seeing rumours now, well not just rumours, reports now, that they're making moves to get rid of EU workers' rights and protections. Things like the 48-hour work week, gone. And the numerous other protections that we have so taken for granted for so long in this country could be just gone overnight because, according to them, it's okay, the market will take care of it. The problem is, the market will not take care of you. Because this is disaster capitalism, warlord capitalism you know, unfettered capitalism at its worst. And you will not be looked after by your employees. There's already a, a warehouse that's rather infamous, and this is why I really call you now, uh, ASOS, do not buy any products from them, because they are absolutely awful. There is a warehouse in Barnsley, and it is infamous. Everyone that works there is on zero-hour contracts. There is an ambulance on permanent standby because there is a heart attack by one of its workers once a week. You know, and there are other stories that we could go into. There are tons out there about, you know, ASOS and the working conditions and, you know, workers complaining about them. And they can't do anything about it because... ASOS won't let people unionise. And there is a union for them, but they can only do so much because, again, unions in, in this country have, have unfortunately been, you know, detoothed and defanged. They can only do so much. And they can't go on strike because many of them need that job. And it's so easy for many people just to say that, oh, well, just go on strike. It's not that easy for them. And besides, technically, they don't work for ASOS. They work for a company that's outsourcing them to work for ASOS. So now you see this bizarre Leviathan that we're getting into and just how worrying we are going to be going forward. So, but let's talk about more about this, quote, dividend, because... That's what the Tories constantly, constantly bragged about. Oh, don't worry, when Brexit's done, we'll have this wonderful dividend. 
So before we jump into the article, please do remember to like and share the video. And of course, down below there are links to my Patreon page and a one-off donation link. And thank you very much to the people that do support me that way. So on with it. So this comes from The Guardian and the title is, If Brexit is done, then where's the dividend? It is two weeks since Britain finally cut its ties with the European Union. And it may foreseem a bit premature to ask how it's all going. But the reality of Brexit in early 2021 is quite stark. We may now be a sovereign nation, which apparently matters a lot to many. But in almost every material respect, the UK is currently worse off than before the 1st of January. Whatever else this tells us, it is a reminder that Brexit is not yet done. Great Britain remains an island off the coast of the EU, which is its major market. This requires policy and action from politicians and parties. Brexit is a stage in that process, but the process goes on and Brexit still shapes it. Consider four live examples all of which on Parliament heard evidence today. First, there is the mountain of paperwork, freshly involved in trading across the channel into the EU. The Food and Drink Federation's Ian Wright told MPs on the Brexit Committee today that a job that typically took three hours before Brexit is now taking five days, even for big companies, and customers and customs enforcers were currently as much in the dark about the rules uh, as exporters were, he added. Secondly, there is a specific effect of all this on the emotive issue of fish and seaport, uh, seafood exports, which is the Scottish uh, National Party berated Boris Johnson at this week's Prime Minister's Question Time. Scottish Food and Drink warned on Thursday that seafood exporters were losing one million in sales Every single day since Brexit. Third, there is the separate specific crisis in the food distribu distribution between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. This week, the big UK supermarkets of long-term shortages in Northern Ireland supermarkets. Andrew Opie of the British Retail Consortium told the Brexit Committee today that this could get worse when the grace period ends on the 31st of March. Finally, there is the ending of full police and security cooperation between the UK and the EU. In the session today, Professor Garma Davis of Northumbria University told the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee that Brexit amounted to an overall security downgrade. Compared with the years of EU membership and highlighted the loss of access to real-time data as the major problem. All committee witnesses were very clear that this deal, whatever its problems, was better than a no deal. It may also turn out that their concerns proved to, proved to be Brexit teething problems. The lateness of the 24th December deal certainly posed massive challenges as the new rules began to bed in but it is also likely that all sides will find workaround solutions. Yet, this would still be a highly optimistic way of looking at the problems facing more than 50,000 UK manufacturers whose whole trade is with the EU. And, while workarounds are to be welcomed, they are inferior to the free package of the past, and they must ultimately be comparable with the law and regulation on both sides. This is another fragile area of the agreement that is yet to be tested. The emotional importance of Brexit, however, should never be underestimated. Support for it will always, uh, always demand more upon the feelings than actual realities. Yet, the plain fact is that there has been no material Brexit dividend of any kind in the first two weeks of the break. Perhaps that does not matter. Perhaps a dividend will come. But perhaps the EU will also succeed in showing that there are real costs to leaving. The current reality is nevertheless that each of the material problems seems to likely to grow more acute. This is true for the distribution chains in particular. And according to Wright, all EU-UK supply chains will have to be re-engineered over the coming months. 
The economic and employment implications of this statement are huge, especially amid the pandemic. The impact on fishing will be especially politically sensitive. And no one predicts that the medium term future for Northern Ireland after Brexit is anything other than delicate. But the uncertainty extends deep into other areas of the economy and society too. Since London can no longer be the financial centre of the EU, UK financial services seemed doomed to decline in importance. So does the attractiveness of UK universities to students and researchers. The arts industries are also vulnerable too, as Simon's Rattle returned to Germany under lines. Lockdowns and travel restrictions means that there is currently less attention to post-Brexit tourism problems, but these will be unquestionably revived later. Conservatives and Labour each have a shared interest in treating Brexit as done. Johnson wants to tout it as his passport to history, especially amid his Covid failures. Keir Starmer can see no route to a Labour majority, or even party unity, of reopening the European issue. This week, he tried to close the file on freedom of movement for, that, for, for his part of that. This may be understandable from the point of view of electoral self-interest, but that does not mean the party interest is the same as the public interest. Material issues over commerce, trade and jobs thrown up by Brexit cannot be ignored just because of talk of why they are occurring may reopen the deep and disturbing uh, divisions of the past decade. Nor there can be, nor there can be there it be a code of silence over the un, un umbilical link between Brexit and issues such as the potential breakup of the UK or the decline in Britain's standing on the world. These are real and growing dangers to Britain, and thus even to Brexit itself. The feeling that Brexit was based on that Britain and the British were being done down by the EU lay behind its enormous political success at home. But beyond leaving the EU, Brexit never amounted to a programme of change. There was no yardstick or other, or, or other, than, other than by the departure by which to judge the policy. This simply remains both the strength and the weakness of Brexit. It means all the areas that were left behind before and after 2016 will now need to be filled in. In practice, this means working with the EU rather than competing against it, whether in trade or foreign policy generally. The head of the foreign affairs think tank Chatton House, Robin Nibbett, wrote this week that Britain will fail after Brexit if it tries to create itself as a minimum great power. The former, the former cabinet minister, David Langdon, sees that he sees the prospect of overtime of various forms of associated agreements between Britain and the EU. None of this is to say that a British return to the EU is remotely on the cards anytime soon. But as time passes, the grip, of ex grip exerted by the voters of 2016 and 2019 will weaken. Britain's multiple living relationships with the EU, meanwhile, will not go away. Decisions will have to be taken. Things will have to evolve. And in one form or another, what we call Brexit will never be an entirely settled issue. We will be deceiving ourselves to treat it as have been done so. And, you know, that's exactly what we've been saying for a while now, ever since the deal came. This, we're going to be living in essentially permanent Brexitness. And to deny the fact that Brexit isn't a problem, or that these issues aren't causing a problem. I mean, we've already seen, just last week on Friday, we went over the farming and the fishing industry's problems already with Brexit. And yet, the solution to solving those problems, especially the fishing one, is very clear. It's just to rejoin the common fisheries policy. It's that simple for the fishermen. But that will put them in the EU sphere of influence. Something which they have said for years they hate and don't want. But it's the only solution that is clearly available to them. UK farmers will have to follow EU rules if they want to continue trading to our biggest, largest market. And, you know, we've said it many times. A lot of the Brexiteers said, 
Uh, Brexit really is all about trade. It's really the opportunity so that we can go and trade elsewhere around the world. That doesn't make sense when our biggest market in our top 10 people we trade with, the only, the only non-Europeans are China and the US. You know, it doesn't make sense. Europe is our most important trade partner, our allies, and we've now turned 27 nations who were our closest partners and allies into seemingly our most important enemies. And make sure that, as we've seen here, the of what he said, of what the foreign policy expert said, that there was going to be in the future a realisation that Britain needs to align more closely with the EU and work together with it. Well, certainly, under this government, they ain't going to do that anyway. They are going to be try and keep Europe as far away as possible. They are going to have a barge pole and be trying out to push the UK away in the English Channel. That is literally what they are going to try and do. This is what they are going to try and do this year in any way, shape they possibly can to try and prove Brexit is a success. And we are only three weeks into the year and already two major um, industries of what the Brexit has used as being shining examples that would be better off outside the EU are already, they haven't said it yet, but they're already giving clear indicators that they were better off in the EU than they are now. So, as always, uh, please do hit that like, sh like and share button on your way out. And of course, down below those links to my Patreon page and a one-off donation link. And thank you very much for those people who do support me that way. And as always, we'll see you all next time.